I start this discussion of the philosophical basis for an African curriculum with a number of initial statements. Uh, being born in the United States of America, I know that the United States itself was born with two birth defects. One was the genocide of the native peoples and the other one was the enslavement of the Africans. It has acquired over many years other defects uh, rooted in the large gap between propaganda and reality. What people say or what they write and what they do. It was necessary for Europeans in the United States and even those in Europe to attack Africa at the very core in order to advance a curriculum of European supremacy. Else, neither enslavement nor colonialism was poss were possible. But we have been the negation in the United States, the black population has been the negation to the negation of our history. And so we have overturned the comfort of the racist by questioning their morality and their facts. This has been the long struggle. I wrote a book uh, some years ago, 10 years or more, called uh, The uh, uh, African American History, uh, a, An Odyssey or a Quest for Liberation, which has been, of course, the principal myth of the African population in the United States. On the other hand, Africa, the continent, and the nations in it, represents the original home of the human species. Africa is where Homo sapiens learn the elementary responses to each other and to the environment. And humans lived in Africa for two-thirds of the time that Homo sapiens have been in existence. It is easy to say that Africa is not only the home of the mother and father of humanity, but the home of the mother and father of civilization. The oldest math calculators found in the world are found in the Lubombo bone in Swaziland. 28,000 years ago, the Africans began to mark uh, the period of women. In Congo, the Isonge bone, 20,000 years ago, represent the second of the oldest mathematical calculators that we have in human history. So this is to set the tone for this discussion, which I hope to uh, cover many aspects of uh, the trouble with understanding Africa, because by virtue of Europe's engagement with Africa at a very negative level, it has also impacted and affected people throughout the world, even in Asia. I see the same uh, experience. That is the experience of, of Europe having colored the minds of Asians regarding Africa. Uh, this is why, for example, a gentleman gave me the other day, two days ago, uh, a list of religions uh, in the world, and there was no African religion listed. And that is because simply one assumes that there are no African religions. And we assume that by virtue of the white racist supremacist attitude that was launched against Africa at the very beginning to assault and attack the humanity of African people. Otherwise, this notion of the enslavement of Africans would have created many psychological problems. In fact, it did and still does. The main trope of the imperialist and European supremacist was colonization of information. It's not just simply the colonization of people and territory, but of information about that territory. Africa, in order to establish a proper curriculum 
must resist this tendency uh, even more now that our curricula, uh, when you look at the curricula at all of the universities, you see the same imitation, the same repetition of Europe. So that uh, it is rare, and I've lived in Africa, traveled throughout the continent, trained the first journalist after the Chimaranga in Zimbabwe, and yet I have never seen an African university in Africa. And I'm sure you have Asian universities in Asia, but we don't have African universities in Africa. We have imitation European universities. And almost all of the ones that are considered great and good are basically copies of European universities. So the, the issue with the curriculum in an African university must be one that starts at the beginning. We may have to reconstruct entire universities. And we can do this, but we have to have the will to do it, and we must know what we are doing. Let me just tell you where we must start. We must start with chronology. That is essential. We must start with chronology in African universities. We must understand that Nubia and Kemet are to Africa as China and India are to Asia and Greece and Rome are to Europe. You have to start there. If you do not start in an African university with Kemet, which is the African name for Egypt, Egypt is the Greek name for the land, if you do not start with Kemet and Nubia, you cannot start properly with an African curriculum. It does not exist. Because what we find in Africa is that most of the universities start with Greece. But this is problematic. 2,500 years before this era, 2,500 years before this era, the Africans had completed the building of the pyramids. 2,500 years before this era, that's like almost 5,000 years ago. The pyramids were up in 2500 BC, if you use that designation. There was no Greece. It didn't exist. 2500 before this era, there was no Rome. It did not exist. So why would an African university start its curriculum from the Greeks. You know, you think the Africans were waiting around for the Greeks before they built the pyramids? You know, people waiting say, you know what, the Greeks are not here yet. We can't do anything. We have to wait till they come. And when they come, they will give us some wisdom and knowledge and teach us geometry. No. That is not the story. The story has to be that at the very beginning, of the history of the African civilizations, African people on that continent itself had already, by 2500 BC, finished the last of the Great Pyramids. They're up. Started around 2900 BC, but by 2500 they're finished. There's no, no Greece. There is a Chinese dynasty of the Shia. There's Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. There's Nubia. There's no Greece. It does not appear. It appears in 1000 BC when we hear the first voice of intelligence from the Greece, Greeks. And that's Homer. And it was not very deep stuff at that. It was. It's not serious, but it's elevated. A thousand BC. This is like 1,500 years after the pyramids are finished. So then you get Homer. And so everything starts now. This is a false chronology. It's a very bad. No civilization among the Greeks predated Nubia. 
Archimet. So why would African universities start there? More, there's more literature written in Africa. This is another one of the arguments that they have made. Well, you know, in Africa, they don't have any literature. And I hear, I hear people make that all, there's no literature. There's more writing in ancient Africa than in ancient Greece or Rome. You can combine Greece and Rome and not have the writing in the Nile Valley. If you take the ancient writings of Nubia and Aksum and Kemet, you have far more writing than you get from the Greeks and the Romans. But if you're trying to deny Africa its place in the sun or African people their humanity, you must try as hard as you can to wipe this out. Fundamentally, I wrote, uh, I've written 72 books, but I wrote early books on African culture and African history. And in one of the books, I wrote about the ancient African philosophers uh, whose names we rarely hear. Imhotep, Patahotep, Dwarf, Amenemhat, Merikari, we know maybe Akhenaten, Kunanup. These were philosophers that lived more than 1,500 years before the first Greek philosopher. Who was the first Greek philosopher? Thales of Miletus. And where did he go to school? In Africa. In fact, when Pythagoras was 19 years old, Pythagoras went to Thales and said to him, teach me what you know about philosophy. And Thales says to Pythagoras, you must do as I have done and go and learn philosophy in Egypt. This is, that is the story. But then why do we start with Thales and Pythagoras? Why don't we know Dwarf and Amenemhat? Why have not we read Patahotep on aging? And if you have an African university, and an African university is not engaged in this process, then what process is the university engaged in except the promotion of white supremacy? No, I'm a great negation to that. I have always been. I think that this is the problem with African education. Plato and Eudoxus both studied in Saïs. Herodotus in the fifth century wrote about Egypt in the histories. If you go read a copy, even now, you read a copy of Herodotus, you are amazed at all the things that the Greeks really got from Africa. In fact, this is why George James writes in his book, Stolen Legacy. This was a Guyanese professor who wrote a book in the 1950s that there is no Greek philosophy. That if you look at the Greek system, what they did was to distort African philosophy. Stolen legacy. You should get this book. 1954 he writes this. And this is why we were able to create black studies, as it was called, in the United States, or now Africana studies, is because we convinced the ac academicians that they had been teaching lies. That what they had been promoting was a Eurocentric notion of the world, the imposition of their particularism as if it were universal. And we would sit in the classrooms and we would listen to them talk about the Greek. If you start anything, any discussion on politics, what they say, Plato. You say, well, what about theater? They say, oh, Sophocles. So, so there was a Greek at every corner. And yet, these Greeks sitting at the doors of every avenue of knowledge were but children to Africa and to India and to China. So, Kemet, Egypt, Egyptos, meaning the temples of the houses of Ptah, had been conquered 
in history by Syrians, Persians, Greeks, Romans. And all of this was before the coming of General El Az from Arabia. When General El Az came at the request of the indigenous Africans from Arabia to help the Africans throw off the Roman oppression. That was 639, this era. And 639, when the Islamic army came to help the Africans throw off the Romans, Egypt had already by that time gone through about four invasions. And so what happens? We get the confusion about ancient Egypt, which we call, I call in my writings, Kemet, and contemporary Egypt. So now people are confused. What is Egypt? But let me just tell you this. Arabic, a very powerful language and a beautiful language, is not indigenous to Africa. It is not an African language. It's not indigenous to Egypt. The ancient Egyptians did not speak Arabic. The ancient Egyptians spoke Chikam. They spoke Medunetra. They spoke what you see in the so-called hieroglyphics, which we call Meronetra, that's what they spoke. That is their language, you see? So part of what we have got to do in Africa is to reinterrogate the ancient background of, of, of Africa and African civilizations. Um, then, now, let me just tell you something else, very powerful. The curriculum is always a political instrument. And because it's a political instrument, we do not realize that geometry is an African creation. And why is it an African creation? Because the Nile River flooded every year. And when the Nile River flooded, in order for people to know exactly how much land they had, how, how big their farms were, they had to have rope stretchers to measure the earth so that when the flood had subsided, they could go and give you the same amount of land you had before the flood came. That's where geometry starts, you see. Astronomy starts there. It starts with people being on top of their houses and being able to look at the clear sky and to record the movements of the, of the heavenly bodies. Medicine starts there. Very early on, 28, 2900, before this era, we have medicine. You read the Ebers papyrus, the mathematical documents, the earliest book of propositions of math that we have, the Rhine papyrus, and the one that's in Moscow called the Moscow papyrus. These are early African books. But if you're in an African university and you have no understanding of this, then you cannot, you cannot create a foundation. There's no platform for you to develop any kind of the sciences or the arts and humanities. The word philosophy itself, according to some scholars, finds its original origin not in the Greek language, certainly not Greek, even though it comes to us in a modern sense. And at least in English, people say philosophy means lover of wisdom. Philo, lover, Sophia, of wisdom. But, the, but if you ask, and I looked at this the other day, you go and you look in a dictionary of etymology of Greek words, and they'll tell you that Sophia, the origin of Sophia is unknown. And I have learned over 40 years of teaching in universities that if I read that something is unknown, I know it comes from Africa. I have to go look because otherwise if you don't, if, it's, if they say unknown, they're only talking about we don't know it in Europe. So you have to look elsewhere. You can't assume that this word is, is coming out of, of the Greek language. And it doesn't. Sophia, 2052, before this era, on the tomb of Antef II, the great Perah of Egypt, you find the expression seba, in English, S-E-B-A, seba. And it talks about the wise, 
the philosopher gets up early in the morning, reflects in the gardens. The Saba, this word Sophia, is derived from Saba. And this is why we, so what they have always told us is that Africa, there is no philosophy. There's, there, there's wisdom statements, but no philosophy. The only people who have philosophy are the Greeks, the Europeans. Even the Asians don't have philosophy. They have myths. The Native Americans, no, they have tales, but not philosophy. Africans, maybe they have religion, but not philosophy. Philosophy is the rational mind. It only comes from Europe. They're the only ones who can think. It's logic. So this notion of wisdom, which in the ancient African tradition we call the Sabayat, which now we, we normally now say Proverbs. But the Sabayat was very ancient and basic to African uh, thinking and culture. It was at the very beginning. So I think what is necessary is for us to revise the entire curriculum from the beginning. We have to, for example, look at the ancient cultures, but we must also study Africa, ge the geography, the, the politics, the ethics of uh, this uh, great continent. In fact, the, the earliest notion of ethics that I can see anywhere in the world is the notion of mat. Mat. And I've written about it in my, in my books, and I've written about it in my paper. Mat, this notion of truth, justice, balance, harmony, righteousness, reciprocity. This is a very basic notion because the Africans believed that at the very beginning of the creation of the world and the universe, the only thing that existed with the divine was mat. And so you look for harmony in life. Everything, you look for balance. Just, you, you, if you don't look for harmony and balance, then you will have chaos. And the whole idea in most African societies that some people call traditional was to hold back chaos. This is why you work for consensus. This is why you not only work for consensus, but you talk, talk, talk. You keep piling up hypotheses, as uh, C.K. Raju would say. This is the whole, if you go to Africa, you will see that this is what it is. You have big discussions, big discussions, because people are trying to arrive at consensus. That is the key. I think the, I, I'm coming to the end here, but I think that we need to examine the old civilizations of Manamatapa. We need to look at uh, Mapum Gubwe. Uh, we need to now revisit the Napta Playa, which is one of the uh, largest megalith sites in the world. Uh, we need to revisit the Eredo Trench uh, in Nigeria, which is supposedly um, a, uh, a man-made construction project that took more energy than the building of the pyramids. Um, th there are many things we, we need to do, but we need a curriculum uh, that would create an environment of inquiry, one that reorients ordinary conversations of people toward excellence, one that would coordinate research interests, and one that would have narratives of excellence uh, for people to follow, because I think that uh, we can do this by dividing the categories of the curriculum into classical studies, narratives, family sciences, not social sciences, but family sciences. Philosophy, law, saku, not psychology, but saku. Uh, Africology, and I have, I, I wrote in 1980 a book called Afrocentricity in 1987. I wrote a book called Kemet uh, Afrocentricity and Knowledge, I'm sorry, uh, The Afrocentric Idea. And then in 1990, I wrote uh, uh, Kemet, Afrocentricity and Knowledge. In those books, what I argue is that the notion of Africology is the Afrocentric study of African phenomena. It is not the study of African phenomena, because we have had Euro Euro Eurocentric studies of Africa for uh, uh, three or four hundred years. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about an Afrocentric study of Africa. That's where we get Africology. That's the study of Africa where the agency is the African people. 
is not agency coming from Europe imposing on Africa. For example, one, one example. You know, I, was happy, I happened to be traveling in China. Uh, I, I was given a guest professorship at one of the universities. And I was traveling around Beijing, and I went to uh, the Ming Dynasty temples. And in the Ming Dynasty temples, I saw a legend written on a historical piece that came from Cheng He. Now, I never heard of Cheng He. Nobody ever told me about Cheng He. But Cheng He went to Africa with a thousand ships a hundred years before Columbus came from Europe to the Americas. But because the way curricula are structured and the way people study knowledge is by the imposition of Europe, what Europe did becomes important, but what the Chinese and Africans did together that's not considered important or part of the curriculum. You see what I mean? So that's what we need to reinterrogate. We need to revisit those places. And then finally, I think what we need to do is to write a revised collective text of Africa. There are no African tribes. Tribes, tribe in African, in the sense of Africa by Europe is a pejorative term. It's not a good term. It's not a positive term. And Europe didn't intend for it to be positive. That's why they call African kings chiefs. You see, but in Europe, they don't call, I don't care how small the kingship is, he's a king. But in Africa, he's a chief. And so this notion of revise, we've got to revise everything, almost everything Europe did. You've got to look at it and examine it. You can't, if you go around saying you're a tribe, then you have to ask yourself, why is it that the French don't call themselves tribes? And certainly, you don't hear the Germans calling themselves tribes. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, back in, the, in, in uh, 200 years ago, they did. But they don't do that now. They say German people. They say the French people. So I always tell people, Yoruba people, Nubian people, Wolof people, you see, Sogo people. You, you, th th these are Zulu people. You, but this notion is always to demoralize and to make smaller the whole record of, of African history. These are the things that I think that we ought to uh, do. We are on the verge of breaking uh, the chain, and uh, one of the great African-American poets, James Weldon Johnson, said it like this. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our parents sighed? We have come over a way that with tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered out of the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I just say, whew, fantastic. I think you opened our eyes a great deal. We forgive you your nationality, and we celebrate <laughs> your origin. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs>